Let's continue reading Han Phase, section 18, facing south. This is where rulers go wrong. Having assigned certain ministers to office, then they try to use unassigned men to check the power of the assigned. They justify this policy by claiming that the interests of the assigned and the unassigned will be mutually inimical. But in fact, the rulers find themselves falling under the power of the unassigned. For the men they are trying to check today are the men whom they used in previous days to check others. If the rulers cannot make the law clear and use it to restrain the authority of the high ministers, then they will have no means to win the confidence of the people at large. If the ruler of men discards the law and instead attempts to use some of his ministers to control others, then those who love each other will band together in groups for mutual praise and those who hate each other will form cliques for mutual slander. With praise and slander striving to shout each other down, the ruler will become bewildered and confused. Those who act as ministers believe that unless they can somehow establish a fine reputation or persuade someone to make a special plea for them, they will never advance in office. That unless they turn their backs on law and concentrate power in their own hands, they can never wield authority. And that unless they rely upon a mask of loyalty and good faith, they can never circumvent the prohibitions. Yet these three types of behavior in fact serve only to delude the sovereign and destroy the law. So the ruler of men must make certain that no matter how wise and capable his ministers may be, they are never allowed to turn their backs on the law and concentrate power in their own hands. No matter how worthy their actions may be, they are never allowed to presume upon their achievements and snatch rewards that belong to others. No matter how loyal and trustworthy they may be, they are never allowed to discard the law and circumvent the prohibitions. This is what it means to make the law clear. The ruler of men is sometimes misled in undertakings and blinded by words. These are two dangers which he must not fail to consider carefully. Ministers come blithely forward with a proposal for an undertaking and because the funds they ask for are small, the ruler is duped by the proposal, misled as to its true nature. He fails to examine it thoroughly but instead is filled with admiration for the men who made it. In this way, ministers are able to use undertakings to gain power over the ruler. This is what it means to be misled in undertakings and he who is misled will be beset by hazard. If when a minister comes forward with a proposal he asks for meager funds but after he has retired to put it into effect his expenditures are very large then although the undertaking may produce results the proposal was not made in good faith. He who speaks in bad faith is guilty of crime and though his undertaking has achieved results, he should receive no rewards. If the rule is obeyed, then the ministers will not dare to dress up their words in an effort to delude the sovereign. The way of the ruler is to make certain that if what a minister says beforehand does not tally with what he says later, or what he says later does not tally with what he has said previously, then although he may have fulfilled his task with distinction, he is condemned to certain punishment. This is what it means to hold your subordinates responsible. If a minister is planning to bring a proposal for some undertaking before the ruler but fears that it will meet with criticism, he will be certain to announce beforehand. Anyone who questions this undertaking does so simply out of jealousy. The ruler with these words firmly fixed in his mind will pay no further heed to the advice of other ministers. While they, for their part, fearful of the effect of such words, will not venture to question the undertaking. When these two circumstances prevail, 
then truly loyal ministers will go unheeded and only those who have managed to acquire a reputation will be put in charge. This is what it means to be blinded by words and he who is so blinded will end up in the power of his ministers. The way of the ruler is to make certain that ministers are called to account for the words they speak and are also called to account for the words they fail to speak. If the beginning and end of their words fail to tally, if their arguments lack proof, then they are called to account for what they have spoken. If they attempt to evade responsibility by saying nothing, although they hold important positions, then they are called to account for not speaking. The ruler of men must make certain that when his ministers speak, he understands the beginning and end of what they say and can hold them responsible for matching it with facts. And when they fail to speak, he must inquire into the cause for their reticence and hold them responsible for that as well. If this is done, then ministers will not dare to speak out recklessly, nor will they dare to remain silent, for they will know that both speech and silence will be equally called to account. When the ruler of men wishes to carry out some undertaking, if he does not acquire a clear understanding of all the factors involved but simply makes obvious his desire to carry it out, then the work will bring no profit, but on the contrary will invariably end in loss. He who comprehends this will know that he must proceed on the basis of principle and discard the factor of desire. There is a proper way of initiating undertakings. If you estimate that the income from a particular undertaking will be large and outlay small, then the project is practical. But a deluded ruler does not understand this. He estimates the income but not the outlay. And though the outlay may be twice the income, he fails to comprehend that this is a loss. Thus, in name he appears to have profited, but in fact he has not. The success is small but the loss great. An achievement can be called successful only if the income is large and the outlay small. But if men are allowed to expend large sums of money without incurring blame and still take credit for the meager successes they achieve, then the ministers will think nothing of spending large sums to accomplish a small aim. Only small gains will be achieved and in addition the ruler will suffer loss. Those who have no understanding of government always tell you, never change old ways, never depart from established custom, but the sage cares nothing about change or no change. His only concern is to rule properly, whether or not he changes old ways, whether or not he departs from established customs, depends solely upon whether such old ways and customs are effective or not. If Yi In has not changed the ways of In and Thai Kong had not changed the ways of Chou, then Thang and Wu would never have become kings. If Quan Chong had not reformed the ways of Qi and Guo Yan had not altered those of Qin, then Dukes Huan and Wan would never have become dictators. In general, those who disprove of changing old ways are simply timid about altering what the people have grown used to. But those who fail to change old ways are often in fact prolonging the course of disorder. While those who strive to gratify the people are after some selfish and evil end, if the people are too stupid to recognize the signs of disorder and their superiors too faint-hearted to adopt reforms, then government has gone awry. The ruler of men must be enlightened enough to comprehend the way of government and strict enough to put it into effect. Though it means going against the will of the people, he will enforce his rule. In proof of this, we may note that Lord Shang, when he came and went at court, was guarded by iron spears and heavy shields to prevent sudden attacks. Similarly, when Kuo Yan instituted his new policies in Qin, Duke Wan provided himself with bodyguards, and when Quan Chong first began his reforms in Qi, Duke Wan rode in an armored carriage. All these were precautions against danger from the people, for the people, in their stupid and slovenly way, will groan at even a small expenditure and forget the great profits to be reaped from it. So, this was section 18. 
going south.